We're going to try to keep this extremely informal so, and make it interactive. So if you have questions, feel free to raise your hand. You don't have to wait to the end of the presentation to do that. Question? Louder. Oh, good, because I can talk very loud. Thank All right, you. sure, we can do loud. So anyway, once again, I, I'd like to thank everybody for coming tonight uh, to join us. Um, this is actually part three of our community lecture series on diabetes. We actually got snowed out once in the fall. We got hurricaned out once in the fall. So we rescheduled it for the spring, and I want, I want to thank you folks for being here. This is just a wonderful turnout, and thank you so much for taking your time to be here tonight. My name is John Sabia, Dr. Sabia. I've been here at the hospital for 26 years. You might have met me in the emergency department. I, if you, uh, I, hope you I hope you didn't have a chance to meet me there, but if you did, I must have done a good job because you're, you're still here. But uh, I've been working here at the hospital for 26 years. I've been director of the ER for 25 of those years. I also have a role, an administrative role at the hospital. I'm medical director of the hospital. I kind of oversee the entire medical staff, and, that, and, that's, and that's pretty much what I do. Um, this lecture series was sponsored, just I, I can't really start without mentioning um, Robert Bowman. Robert Bowman was a long -term, uh, longtime board member at the hospital, who was a very, very hospital friendly man who did just an awful lot for this institution, loved the hospital, passed away a couple of years ago, and kind of left off an educational fund to be used um, for diabetic education and diabetic lecture series. And he has, and basically in his memory, we, he has sponsored this series. So I, I, I couldn't really not mention Bob. Happened to know him very personally. Just a really good guy who loved the hospital and, was, and really did a lot for the institution. So um, we actually named this, di this special diabetic series after him. So the way the night's going to go is we're going to do, myself, and I'll, I'll certainly introduce some of our speakers in a second, we're going to kind of do a brief overview of diabetes, talk a little about the statistics and how prevalent it is out there. We're going to talk about um, how us doctors make the diagnosis and, and also what we do to track the progress of diabetics, um, how we treat diabetes, how we educate diabetics, and most important, you know, what we, what, we really, what we really learn. We learn a lot from our patients. Our patients teach us a lot, and when patients really own that disease and understand it, they are our partners for life, and they are part of the solution, and they do a wonderful job. Um, I did ask a couple of my uh, patients. I do also a little private practice one day a week down in High Park. A uh, little family, uh, do some family doctor type work. So I asked a couple of my patients to join us this evening. So kind of at the end of the didactic sessions, we'll just they'll talk a little bit about um, their progress and how they're doing, and um, what their experiences was when they first became a diabetic, and how they're doing today. Um, Dr. Kemp is with me this evening. She is a family physician who, who works in this community, works in Rhinebeck, treats lots and lots of them. She is just a sweetheart, a great doctor, but more important, a great person, and has been at the hospital now for, oh my gosh, five, six years? Like, seven. Seven. I sure changed her a year. She's been in the community seven years. This lady over here, probably everybody knows this lady, Rufia. She is, you know, like the ace dietitian um, anywhere. I mean, she, you know, she's the best of the best. And uh, really cares about patients and uh, just has a wonderful attitude. Has helped so many people, not just diabetic patients. So she's with us tonight, too, and she's going to be talking a little bit about some dietary tips and dietary management of diabetes, which is probably the top of the list with respect to treatment of a diabetic. So let's start. Okay, so just a couple of statistics and uh, pretty astounding numbers when you really look at them. But 25 million people, or 8% of the population, are diabetics in the United States. Pre-diabetes, and this is kind of a scary statistic, affects almost 80 million people. Well, what does pre-diabetes pre pre mean? Those are the folks that are kind of out there with just maybe minimally elevations of their blood sugar, minimally signs of the disease. Um, and they may have those subtle signs for many, many years and not even know they have diabetes. And a lot of times those folks can develop diabetes. So lots of folks have that. Um, interesting enough, under age 20, and this is, you know, the so-called type 1 or juvenile, juvenile diabetic, we call that, um, 1 in 400 have diabetes. And these numbers have absolutely been climbing over the last 20 years. 231,000 deaths yearly attributed to diabetes. And there are lots of reasons unfortunately that people die from diabetes and we'll talk about that in a little bit. The number one cause is heart disease but there's lots of other stuff that unfortunately um, does cause mortality in diabetics. Um, and the cost of care, about $175 billion a year. So um, it's, it's, you know, it's clearly a major disease. It's costly. Um, there's certainly significant complications with it but however we can actually help patients and patients can help themselves with, uh, with good treatment guidelines. 
Okay, so the diabetic complications, I kind of threw this in there. I kind of threw heart disease because this is the leading cause of death in diabetics, believe it or not. Everybody knows of any of those issues that can affect the eyes. It can affect the kidneys, of course. It's the leading cause of kidney failure in the United States. Neuropathy, that's kind of when the diabetes affects the nerves and it mostly affects the legs. You get a little numbness and tingling in your legs. That's what we call neuropathy. A lot of times you get pain in your legs, diabetics. That's what we call, that's, that's what we mean by neuropathy. Peripheral vascular disease, that's basically, and you know, as you know, a significant complication of diabetes could be amputations. So peripheral vascular disease is when the blood vessels in the legs, the feet, um, get affected by diabetes, and the blood vessels kind of close down, close up, and then it kind of shuts the circulation off to those parts, and then it could lead, it could lead to amputation. Um, and stroke uh, is certainly um, also a complication of diabetes. Now, if you look at all these complications, why? I mean, just because I have a little elevation in my blood sugar in my bloodstream, that's why this happens? Well, there's no question, if you get your blood sugars under control, you have less chance of getting these complications. But believe it or not, diabetes affects the blood vessels, and that's how it does this. The small little blood vessels in your body, um, blood vessels in your heart, in your brain, in your feet, in your eyes, in your kidneys, when your diabetes is not well controlled, those blood vessels tend to kind of close down and, they, and the blood supply to those areas gets diminished. And when you don't have a good su blood supply to organs, that's when organs can, can suffer damage. And that's really the cause of some of those symptoms. Types of diabetes, a couple types of diabetes. Um, basically, let's define it first. Um, our, ins our pancreas is that organ in the body that kind of makes insulin. It kind of secretes it in the bloodstream when you need it. You eat a, you eat a meal, well guess what? If you eat a meal, and you've, lots of your meals have sugar and carbohydrates in them. So when you eat a meal, you got sugar in your bloodstream. Well, insulin comes out, it takes that blood, takes hold of that sugar, and it puts it in your cells. And that's how your body actually, that's how your body functions. That's food for your muscles in your body. When you can't get the, that blood sugar in the cells, or if you don't have enough insulin, the blood sugar just lays in your bloodstream, and then your blood sugar level goes high and that's what we don't want. So it can be two reasons, and many times it happens because of, both, because of both issues. Inadequate release of insulin, the pancreas just doesn't make it or, or it release enough insulin, but most important, we see an abnormal utilization of insulin results in high blood sugar levels. You got plenty of insulin, but for some reason your, your cells don't respond to the insulin and it can't get that blood sugar molecule into, into your muscles, into the cells. So you got enough insulin, but for some reason, you just can't use it adequately. Type 1 diabetes, that's the one we see in the younger population. The, certainly the younger, you know, we've, we've, I've seen three or four year old children develop diabetes, the type 1 diabetes. Those are the folks that are usually the insulin is just not making it. Type 2 diabetes is certainly much, much more common. You know, that's the one you see later on in life, but there's no later on in life anymore. We're seeing this in 30 year olds. We used to say 50, 60 years old was a type 2 diabetic. We're seeing it in younger ages. So type 2 is the most common form, and that's when the body may not, it does, does produce insulin, maybe not enough, but most important, the cells cannot use the insulin effectively. Gestational diabetes tends to happen um, in pregnancy, and that's basically when the blood sugar kind of elevates during the pregnancy, and um, you know, that's, it's pretty uncommon we do see that in some folks. In fact, my wife during one of her pregnancies had gestational diabetes. Symptoms, I mean, these are certainly, if your blood sugar runs high, you can develop these symptoms. Um, thirst, increased urination, hunger, of course, slow healing and infection. We're not really sure why that's the case, but they think possibly, listen, if you got lots of sugar in your body, right? Well, I guess the bacteria love sugar, they're gonna grow. So that's a theory why people get infection with high blood, with high blood sugar. So that's a theory, but there's no question they're slow healing and infection. Part of the reason also is that, remember I mentioned before, those blood vessels? tend to kind of get smaller and smaller. Well, guess what? You need a good blood supply to your body for healing. If you don't have a good blood supply, you can't bring the right blood, the blood products to that area to make them heal. So that's part of it. Blurred vision, once again, high blood sugar tends to cause blurred vision. We talked about how diabetes can certainly cause eye issues. You know, that when, you know, it affects certainly the blood vessels behind your eye. That's why you do see some blindness from diabetics. Fatigue, and some patients actually have no symptoms. They're kind of walking around with, you know, blood sugars in the 200 range and really have no symptoms. And that's that so-called pre-diabetic I was telling you about. 
risk factors, I mean, there's probably more than this, but there's no question. Obesity is a risk factor. Family history is certainly is certainly a family history. Um, the reason obesity can be a risk factor is you've got lots of fat cells, and you know you may have lots of insulin, but for some reason, when you have a big body mass, and, and Rufia can probably explain this better than me, and I'll ask her to do this later on, it's really harder for your body to get to use the insulin to get the blood sugar in those cells. But I'll let her talk a little bit more about that. And I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Kemp because she certainly treats a lot more diabetics than me, and she's going to review some of the uh, some of the uh, the key things we do to make diagnosis, and she's going to talk about some of the treatment. Thank you, Dr. Savia. Uh, good evening. Uh, thank you, Dr. Savia, for that introduction. I'm really pleased to be here, and we're going to try to make it as informal as possible. So. If I'm talking too fast or if I say something or a word or that you don't understand, stop me because you really should walk away from here having a clear picture of the discussion. Generally speaking, just to start off with, I think the most important thing Dr. Sabia said was that this is a partnership. So one of the things that goes in diagnosis is to be able to have a relationship with your physician that starts with a yearly exam. So if your physician knows you and has been doing routine blood work, it's a lot easier to detect any abnormality. Now that's not to say you shouldn't call them if you have a problem, but again, this is where having that relationship will help make diagnosis a lot easier because it would be a lot easier to identify abnormals. So essentially a fasting blood sugar means that you haven't eaten for about eight hours. Now all of us have had blood tests done and so when your doctor says fasting blood work it means do not eat anything or drink anything that would interfere with the blood sugar levels and that would be about eight hours. Now any fasting blood sugar above 126 is a red flag for diabetes. Now again, it should be an eight hour fast. That doesn't mean a little cup of coffee with a little bit of cream and sugar, that's what I usually get, or a little bite of a muffin or two, two Cheerios, doesn't count. You have to have a complete fasting. So if there is 126, or and or if there is a random blood sugar, say you go in, you're not feeling well, and your blood, your doctor does the blood work on the spot, and it's more than 200, that's also a big number to look at. So again, these are numbers. Uh, walking away tonight, you don't have to know specifics. This is more as a physician. I should be looking at target numbers for you. Um, so fasting blood sugar is a very important way of diagnosing um, diabetes to begin with. Detecting pre-diabetic, insulin resistance, these are a lot of the terms that are heard. So it's not just about being a diabetic, it's about having a blood sugar that's anywhere above 100. That's the magic number these days. You do not want to be above 100 and that puts you at risk for diabetes. Hemoglobin A1C, that's a term you hear thrown around a lot. Hemoglobin A1C is an average of your blood sugars. So essentially it's a blood test that's done very specifically ordered that'll give you a three month average of your blood sugars. It's a number that's a percentage. So you're looking for a magic percentage number. Anything 6.5 and below is considered to be quote unquote normal range. Now I'm a little bit more stringent in the American Diabetic Association, the guidelines as well. Anything from 5.7 to 6.5 is still considered pre-diabetic. You still need to be concerned at the, about the patient's risk factor. Again, these are numbers that you don't have to per se, but wanting to be an educated patient, your doctor will speak to you about hemoglobin A1C. So that's one of the ways we also detect it. And we do a hemoglobin A1C on patients that we feel have risk factors. Again, overweight patients, body mass index, you've heard that term, height, weight ratio. That's why whenever you go into a doctor's office, that dreaded scale, you know, that's why it's important to get weighed so that we know where you're on this risk factor spectrum. So, um, so those are basically the main things blood test wise for diabetes. There's more specifics, like say if I had a concern about a blood sugar, I may send you for a two hour glucose tolerance. Again, very specific terms. And that's where they give you a bunch of sugar in a lab and then they test your blood sugar to see how your body responds. And the two hour glucose is, is helpful when there's some question as to whether the body is becoming diabetic. So these are again helpful tools for us as physicians and healthcare providers. 
Um, other helpful tests, um, you know, you want to look at liver and kidney functions. As Dr. Sabia said, kidney functions is a crucial element to diabetes and the disease. So you always want to monitor the blood work. And generally speaking, it should be done every three months for diabetics. Every three months, you should have your blood work done. EKG, again, as Dr. Sabia mentioned, heart disease is a major factor. And an EKG is an electrocardiogram. It basically, it's, they place leads on different parts of your body to give you a picture of what the heart is doing. It's not an exact science, but it gives you a basic concept if the heart is moving in the right direction, if the rhythm is the right direction. If there's any abnormalities, the way you want to look at it is if a big wire system, there's a, if there's a misfire at some level of the wires, you're going to get electrical systems that don't conduct correctly, so the EKG will come out abnormal. So that's really what it is. It's the electrical conduction of the heart. So and diabetes will disrupt that if, there is, if it destroys any of the vessels. Um, monofilament, again, that's testing. Dr. Sabia mentioned something called uh, neuropathy. So if you have nerve or nerve disruption or nerve damage, Think of sugar as, have you ever seen uh, sugar laid out, if you did sugar water on your, um, or baking, like icing on cookies and cakes, you know how it does that crystal, it looks like that crystallization? That's what it does to your vessels. So it actually, sugar will crystallize your vessels in that sense. Not exact, I'm just giving you an overview. And that's what makes it more fragile to break. So what you want to do is, you do monofilaments, which is you lightly touch areas of the body furthest away from the heart, the toes and the fingers, to see if there's been damage, because those are the smallest vessels that'll get damaged first. Now, the problem is, if small vessels are being damaged, you're assuming that large vessels are being damaged as well. So it's important to look for those little subtle signs. Lipid levels, cholesterol, you know, again, hand in hand with heart disease. If you could tolerate a certain cholesterol level, level in a patient who's not diabetic, you have absolute no tolerance for elevated cholesterol in a diabetic. You have almost five times the risk of heart attack with diabetes if you have elevated cholesterol. So it is not something to in any way mess with. So we check the LDL, the HDL, these are all numbers, your cholesterol to make sure that they're, they're level. And urine, urine is a very, very good way of telling whether you're spilling sugar. And the reason is those kidneys, if you think they're sponges, they take in everything from your body, they filter. If that too much of, there's too much sugar or there's too much stuff left over from the um, diabetes, that sponge will start to spill over into the urine and that, that the urine will fill with actually sugar. You'll see sugar in the urine. So that's a really good way. Or protein, which is basically the way the kidney is saying, help, you know, I have too much sugar, I can't, I can't process. So these are, again, useful tests that are, that are part of it. Um, as far as treatment is concerned, education, you being here tonight is the greatest thing you can do. Having conversation with your doctor about your blood tests, um, where am I on my sugar level, doctor? Where am I on my hemoglobin A1C? How is my LDL? You know, we tend to think that as doctors, everybody understands what we're saying, but you have to tell us to slow down, explain it to me. Am I where I need to be? And this is so education and what is diabetes? How does it work? How does it affect me? How often should I be seeing a doctor? And diet. I will in no way pretend to know as much as the guru sitting to my left, so I will leave that to her. But essentially, this is a disease that can be beaten by these first three, education, diet, and exercise. There's not a single person that has diabetes who can, can say that they can't get rid of their diabetes without these three. And that really is, in essence, the whole point of tonight's lecture is that it is a preventable, treatable disease with these three things. Um, so I'll let her talk about diet exercise. Um, there's no excuse. I have two children, three and one at home, and I still find in a full-time practice, and I still exercise every day. So I assure you, I understand what it's like to be busy. All it takes is 15 minutes a day to start out with. Um, you should have exercise every single day, 15 minutes, 
doesn't have to involve any type of gym, doesn't have to involve anything. You can get two water bottles and just dance in a circle in your room for 15 minutes. As long as you get your heart rate up, you put your finger on your pulse on your neck and you feel it and you've, you've raised above 100 if you take beta, you know, medications or anything, but if you've raised your heart rate a little bit, you feel a, bit, a little bit of a light sweat. If you talk, it takes a little bit of effort you're doing good cardiovascular exercise. And if you're not there yet, just start walking, that's all. Just walk up and down your stairs in your apartment or your home, walk around your, your house. There's really, you don't have to do anything dramatic like join a gym or some crazy fitness guru scenario. It's just by walking, that's all it takes. And if you can't walk, because walk, if you're somehow wheelchair bound, then there's upper body exercises that you can do. Again, you know, lifting weights in a wheelchair or uh, moving, you know, doing uh, different types of upper body exercises. Stretches are also another way to do it. So it's not just about moving your legs, it's just your upper body as well. Medications, I mean, I, I think I'll wait and see if you have que specific questions. The standard guidelines as far as medications are to start on patients who have been diagnosed with diabetes with metformin glucophage, if you know. You know, it's, there's a, it's, it's very much a scenario that's between you and your doctor as to when they would start that or how they would start that. Certain patients, unfortunately, it's recommended to go straight to insulin. And then obviously, if those fail, then you would start adding other agents. Um, so the mainstays are now these oral, many you know, medications you take by mouth, hypoglycemics, which mean oral medications used to lower blood pressure. The number one is metformin. Whole categories of other drugs that are used as well, all of them involve stimulating either the liver or the pancreas to work better at absorbing the blood sugar um, or controlling the blood sugar that's running around rampant in your system. And that's how metformin works. Literally pulls back the sugar that's sitting in your, your system and stores it in the liver where it's supposed to be so that you can use it later. That's what a non-diabetic does with their storage. They store it in their liver. So metformin helps you to do that. Um, as far as insulin, it has its own cost, as far as, you know, cost, uh, as far as benefit analysis, as far as what is good or not. Really, it is truly the most uh, beneficial treatment that we have for patients that have uncontrolled diabetes. So, but what I'll do is, as far as specific treatments, if that's okay with you, Dr. Sabia, if we can leave that sure. for some of the discussion. So, because there's really a lot of detail as far as specific medications. But the ACE inhibitors, that's um, for blood pressure control, because again, going back to it, you've got to have strict control. And the ACE inhibitors will control not only your blood pressure, will help the kidneys better function. So that's one, one of the medications we look at. And cholesterol lowering medications like Lipitor. Uh, not, I mean, there's not just cholesterol, Lipitor, but there's nice, I mean, there's a lot of different scenarios, but you want something that'll control the cholesterol to keep it at a low number because you just can't tolerate high cholesterol, so. As far as the monitoring, you know, you really, like we talked about, you want to have a good um, relationship with your physician frequent office visits, hemoglobin A1Cs every three months, cholesterol every three months. Your target for a hemoglobin A1C is seven or below. You know, that's essentially what the new guidelines dictate. Again, we tend to be more stringent. We hope to see patients 6.5 and below, because that really your body's tricked itself into thinking it doesn't have diabetes. So that works out pretty well. The kidney function you want to look at, the urine you want to look at, those generally, again, um, year, yearly now for urine, uh, two times a year for some, for some individuals. A yearly eye exam, this is a diabetic eye exam, not just glasses. They would look in the back of the eye to make sure those tiny vessels that are there are healthy and that nothing has happened to them. And foot exams, because again, it's those tiny vessels you worry about and the places furthest from the heart like the feet seem to be affected the most. So you wanna make sure there's no cuts or scrapes or bruises that you haven't noticed that get infected easily. So you wanna be very diligent about your feet, especially the way they're cut, because sometimes cutting the nail can cause a scrape or a bruise that can get infected. So again, these are all things that are covered by insurances, covered by Medicare, um, but definitely something that we recommend. 
And home glucose, as far as checking your blood sugars, this is something that you know your doctor would prescribe. You would want to check your blood sugar first thing in the morning. That's your fasting blood sugar. That's the, one of the more important tests that we look at. And then right after meals, we either do two hours after meals or right before a meal. That's dependent on you and your doctor. Generally speaking, at least twice a day for patients that are uncontrolled. And once you're controlled, it really depends on the routine that you set up with your doctor. My, some of my patients that are well controlled enough, we only test once or twice a week. Um, other ones we're still working on can be testing up to four times a day. So that's again where you prick your finger, it's a machine, you place a drop of blood, and it analyzes it pretty quickly to tell you what your blood sugar is. Okay. So, and that's essentially it as far as the monitoring. Um, and I think I'll leave this now to you. Right. No problem. Good evening, everyone. As Dr. Sabio and Dr. Kemp mentioned, diet plays a very important role in managing your diabetes. I don't like to mention or say diet because diet, everybody, when it's bad enough, you're told you have diabetes. You get nervous, you get stressed, and then they tell you, oh, you need to go on a diet. Um, diet is a trillion dollar um, industry in this country. So it's about healthy eating. Uh, it's about, I always say, it's about learning to love the food that loves you back. <laughs> and um, changing your relationship with food. And learning that really eating healthy, even if you didn't have diabetes, it helps you physically and emotionally. Because food, not only good food, not only fuels your body, but also fuels your brain. Um, sugar is addictive. So when it comes to diabetes, really it's avoiding sugar. And um, it's not just, you know, white sugar. It's avoiding honey, maple syrup, corn syrup, high fructose, reading ingredients. Don't fall for advertisement in food industry, um, especially when it comes to bread, cereal, health bars. Those are very, very important. Read the ingredient. Don't just look the grams of sugar. Um, it is really important if you're buying cereals, um, read the ingredient, no more than six grams of sugar per serving. Never buy cereals that ha says it has antioxidant in it, has fruit in it, because that fruit is nothing but sugar. Never buy cereal that has added nuts to it. That's not a healthy cereal. Just changing little things. Avoiding fruit juices. Yes, fruit juice, is sim even though it's fruit, patients tell me, what about if I make my own juice? And I say, well, it's still a sugar, it's simple sugar. You see, even though you're squeezing <coughs> your own uh, orange or your own, you're doing juicer, I know juicing is a big thing now, and I laugh. You can do vegetable juice, but not fruit juice. Because it's simple sugar, you have a very, quick rise in blood sugar. Makes you feel good for 20 minutes, then your blood sugar drops and you're hungry again. So no juices and nothing white. As simple as no white bread, no white rice, no white potato. Yes, you can learn to love brown rice or black rice. Yes, a lot of you, I'm sure, say, oh, it's tasteless. But if you cook it with um, low-salt broth, vegetable broth, or chicken broth, makes it tasty. Simple things. And the most important thing, you have to eat six times a day. It's not about uh, dieting, you know, eating, cutting back. No, actually, no. You have to eat six times a day. You have to eat protein six times a day. Lean protein. You could be a vegan 
and still eat protein six times a day. Nuts are a good source of protein, but remember, they're also high in calorie. You want to make sure also by eating healthy, maintaining a healthy weight. Of course, I always say if you weight, for example, if you're 5'2", your ideal body weight, if you look, it says 110, and if you weight at age 18, 150 pounds, and now you are 200 pounds, I'm not going to ask you, oh, this is where I want you to be. So we have to look at your weight realistically. So it is important that not only you're eating, you're making healthy changes in your food, but also remember, you want to have a healthy weight. By just losing 10 pounds, you can lower your numbers, 10 pounds you can lower your numbers. So nuts, it's a healthy snack, but it's dense, it's high in calorie. Yes, it has good fat, the monosaturated fat, which is cardioprotective, which is good for your heart, but it's high in calories, so you want to limit your portion. So eating protein, peanut butter, but has to be natural peanut butter, almond butter, it's healthy protein. Um, if you're not vegan, you could use um, dairy, but has to be low-fat dairy. Yes, yogurt, I know Greek yogurt, a lot of you now eat Greek yogurt, but remember, has to be plain, low-fat Greek yogurt. You add your own fruit to the yogurt. You can sweeten yogurt with Truvia or Stevia. I honestly don't like artificial sweetener because it affects the brain the way the regular sugar does. And I want you two books I want you to read, which is really interesting. If you don't like reading books, then you can get the audio. One book, the first book, which is very important, I think every diabetic should read that book. It's by Dr. David Kessler. He was the FDA commissioner during President Bush and President Clinton. The name of his book is Ending Overeating. It is not about overeating. It's about what food does to your body, especially if you have prediabetes or diabetes. And the second book, which is kind of very new, is by Michael Moss. And the name of the book is Salt, Sugar, and Fat how this three combination actually work on the brain like cocaine and alcohol. So a lot of you might think, why don't I have the control uh, to lose the weight or stop? Yes, I wanted to eat one cookie. Why one cookie becomes 10 cookies? <laughs> or I want to eat only half a cup of ice cream. Why do I end up eating quarter gallon of ice cream. So it's not because you have no self-discipline or self-control. It's how the combination of sugar and fat affects your brain. So I think that actually frees you. Once you know this, it helps you to avoid those foods by also not eating the right snack, not eating the right breakfast, that really could be a trigger for you to crave more carbohydrate and more sugar. A lot of you who know me, you know me by bagel is poison. And I really don't mean it, it is really poison, but it is if you're pre-diabetic or diabetic. Because a bagel, a good bagel, weighs about seven ounce. But per ounce, bagel has 15 grams of carbohydrate. That alone is equivalent to eating seven slices of bread. I have one of my clients who's from the other side of the river. There is a famous bagel shop in Kingston. I'm sure their bagel is delicious. She told me she weighed that their bagel is about nine ounces. Could you imagine eating you know, a bagel for, a for breakfast that's nine ounces? Just count the grams of carbohydrate. Ideally, I'm very strict. Ideally, if you want a good, real, wonderful number of blood sugar, one should not eat max 35 grams of, I call it high quality carbs per meal. The whole grain bread, um, you want when you're buying bread is very confusing. 
You read the ingredient. Again, no corn syrup, no high fructose. And you don't want your bread to have more than 15 grams of carb per slice. These little things honestly makes a change in your blood sugar level. You'll be surprised. So because it's confusing, people think if they buy 10 grain bread or 12 grain bread, that's a good bread. But if once you look at Per slice, how many grams of carb? You can't believe it. So, and also make sure the bread doesn't have corn syrup and high fructose. That's really important. Breakfast is the most important meal of the day, but you want a combination of healthy carbs or high quality carbs and protein, lean protein. You could have eggs if you don't have high cholesterol, but I always say, Please buy local eggs. You want an egg or get it from your neighbor if they have chickens. You want an egg that there's no hormone, no antibiotic in it. If you have elevated cholesterol, according to American Heart Association, you can have four yolks per week. Otherwise, enjoy the egg whites. You can have half a cup or a cup of egg white. Add vegetable to your breakfast. Spinach, Swiss chard, kale, tomatoes, eat vegetable of the season. Like now, we are going into tomato season, zucchini season. Make yourself an omelet for breakfast. If those of you who like smoothie, please don't ever, ever, even from health food store, buy a smoothie. You want to drink a smoothie that you make at home. Because when you buy a smoothie out, it's made with fruit juice and also has sugar in it. Please do not buy a smoothie from fast food restaurants or even health food restaurants. You only drink a smoothie that you make at home. If you want a smoothie for breakfast, yes, you can use yogurt, add berries to it. Um, you can add flaxseed, which is omega-3 fatty acid, it's full of fiber, and fiber we know helps lower blood sugar. How it lowers blood sugar? It really doesn't lower blood sugar, but what it does when you eat the healthy carb, it slows the breakdown of sugar. So you don't get that quick high and you drop, that's when you get tired, sleepy, you can't focus, you can't concentrate, and you crave carbs. So by adding fiber to your smoothie or chia seed, Chia seed is also omega-3 fatty acid. It's the most potent plant, the most potent form of plant form of omega-3 fatty acid. So you add a tablespoon of chia seed and a tablespoon of flax seed to your smoothie with berries. Now, some of you might say it's not sweet enough, I don't like it. You could always add a packet of truvia or a packet of stevia to it and add quarter teaspoon of vanilla extract to it so it has some vanilla flavor. So you could have a smoothie for breakfast, especially when it's summertime and it's hot, you don't feel like you want, you know, your typical breakfast. So it's really important you eat a healthy, lean, protein breakfast. And if you choose carbs, has to be healthy carb, slow carb. Oatmeal is great but not packet oatmeal and not flavored oatmeal. It has to be, the, you know, quick oat and a portion is important. It's all about portion. So if you're eating oatmeal, only a cup cooked, half a cup dry with protein, and you say you don't have time, you can add walnuts to your uh, oatmeal for protein and add some blueberries to your protein. And that gives a flavor. Cinnamon also, I'm sure a lot of you read studies that cinnamon helps lower blood sugar. We had Dr. Ortiz here um, when we had part of our series in November, and he did say that he has noticed He's a great, great uh, endocrinologist. He did say that he's noticed patients who take cinnamon, it helps lower their blood sugar. But again, it doesn't mean you can eat cakes, uh, bagels, wraps, you know, a, 
potato chips and take two tablespoons of cinnamon a day and say, I don't get it. Why is my blood sugar not coming down? So it's really, it has to be combination with healthy eating. And also it is important that you increase your physical activity. So it has to be, as Dr. Kim mentioned, exercise and diet. It really, really goes hand in hand. Healthy snack is important. Eating lunch, healthy lunch is important. You want to make sure that you have protein for lunch. If you just have a salad without any protein, could be tuna fish, could be chicken, could be turkey, it could be a cup of beans. Yes, you can buy canned beans. Make sure you rinse it real well. Add a cup of chickpeas to your salad. A cup of chickpeas has 20 grams of protein, equivalent to three ounces of meat. It is important that you limit your fruit so you can have as much fruit as you want. I know those of you maybe are familiar with Weight Watchers. I get very annoyed because when diabetics now go to Weight Watchers, it, fruit is free. No, it isn't free. Um, a serving of fruit the size of a tennis ball has 15 grams of fructose in it, sugar. So you want to limit your fruit to three servings a day. Vegetable is free. You can have as much, half of your plate should be vegetable as much vegetable as you want, with the exception of a starchy vegetable. Corn, peas, butternut squash, and acorn squash. If you eat corn, you do not eat another starch with it. The same thing with peas. You eat one starch, one kind of a starch per meal. And the rest of your meal should be lean protein and vegetable. For afternoon a snack, the best snack is a serving of fruit when you get the low sugar, an apple, a pear, an orange. Yes, even banana, but a small banana with protein. Could be with peanut butter, could be with nuts, could be with cheese, could be with a slice or two of turkey. And dinner, it is important. You eat lean protein, salad, vegetable, and if you choose whole grain, limit your grain to a cup cooked. It is much easier to say, okay, she said a cup cooked. Whether it's brown rice, whether it's quinoa, whether it's millet, whether it's wheat berry, kasha, pasta, whole grain pasta. If you're Italian, you love pasta. Even if you're not Italian like myself, you love pasta. <laughs> then you know, you cook it once a week. But make sure it's whole grain pasta and limit your per portion to a cup cooked. And what you can do in the same pot that you're cooking the pasta, add the last five minutes at broccoli, at cauliflower, at, you know, so you mess up only one pot. Because when you eat vegetable, vegetable are excellent source of fiber. I always say fiber doesn't come in a box. Fiber doesn't come in a package. Fiber comes from vegetable. We do not eat enough vegetable in this country. One should eat eight cups of vegetable a day. That includes your salad. I was reading a book by Dr. Furman. Don't, I'm sure some of you are familiar with him. He said in his book that reversing heart disease he suggests that before you eat a meal, eat a head of romaine lettuce. <laughs> As I was reading it, and I said to myself, oh my God, you know, it sounds a little crazy, but you know what? And there are people, if you go Google him, there are patients that actually reverse their heart disease by following his meal plan. Um, why? Because it's fiber, and fiber fills you up. So it is important you recognize that vegetable are the fiber you're looking for. If you're eating um, protein bars, I have patients who bring in their fiber one bars to my office. I go nuts 
because it's full of junk. It has corn syrup, it has high uh, fructose, or a special K bar. They tell me a special K cereals. They are all full of really poison. Uh, additive, preservative, colors, eat the real food. Eat the real food. Eat nuts, eat seeds, eat avocado. Avocado has the good fat, monosaturated fat, and fat stops your craving, good fat stops your craving for carbs, for sugar. I'm not saying eat a whole avocado a day, half an avocado a day. You could mash it, use it as a mayonnaise. And if you have diabetes, you really don't want to use butter. You don't want to use whole fat dairy. You don't want to use mayonnaise. If you use mayonnaise, use light mayonnaise. Um, in place of butter, what I usually recommend is olive oil. I don't like the sprays. I think that whole process, it's not good. How do they get it in a can? You know, I always tell patients, I want you to lose weight. I want you to have better numbers for cholesterol and sugar, but I also don't want you to end up with cancer. So it is really important you go for healthy, green, wholesome food. So use olive oil in moderation. And always remember, if you eat 100 calorie extra a day, is a pound a month. And it takes 3,500 calorie deficit to burn a pound of fat. So you see, it's really, it's easy to gain hard to lose. So it is really important you be mindful of your portions. Even olive oil, you can't use unlimited amount. A tablespoon of olive oil has 120 calories. So you want to use it mindfully, sparingly, and staying away from fried food and fast food. Never go food shopping on an empty stomach. Never go to a restaurant when you're starving. Always, before you leave the house, have one of those cheese, string cheese, uh, part to skim, or have a handful, small handful of nuts with a piece of apple. If you know it's five o'clock and dinner is at eight o'clock, don't wait until eight o'clock because you smell the food, everybody is ordering the bread basket on the table, right and so you're going to go for it so the best is to have a light snack before you leave the house i talk too much so if you <laughs> no, no, no. <laughs> um so if you have any questions i could go on for hours but wow wow well, she stole the show didn't she <laughs> my god sure questions go ahead yeah. The author of their book, Ending Overeating, was David Kessler, was it? Yes. Kessler. And Sugar, Salt, and Fat is right. by Michael Moss. Yeah, Everyone should read Kessler's book. Really makes a difference how you look at food. What do you think about coconut milk? Coconut milk, you know, I don't know. I have to ask Dr. Kemp. Makes me nervous because it has saturated fat. And I have Indian friends, they all have high cholesterol. And I say to myself, you know, they grew up with coconut, how come they have high cholesterol? Actually, I'm going to be honest, my husband has diabetes and high cholesterol, the whole thing. So he comes home, he doesn't listen to me, he listens to his co-workers. He has coconut milk, you know, and I started screaming at him and I said, Oh, no, it's good. I said, no, you have high cholesterol. What happened? You know, use skim milk or soy milk or almond milk. So that's my, just my... Say soy milk or almond milk? Right. If you have history of breast cancer in your family, your aunt or your grandma or yourself, please limit soy. If you have thyroid problem, if you take thyroid medication, please stay away from soy products. Right. And the almond milk, I always tell people, I use almond milk. It's not because it has protein. If you look at almond milk, even the best organic has only two grams of protein. 
Right, so, you know, your best bet is 1% or skim milk. And make sure it's a milk that is from grass-fed cow, no hormone, no antibiotic. Did you say almond milk is okay or not? I'm confused. Yes, it is, but you can count on it as protein if you're making a smoothie. You need to add to it uh, yogurt okay. or protein powder. And brown rice is fine. As long as you eat a cup cooked. Even brown rice, if you eat more than a cup, could affect your blood sugar. Grain, only a cup cooked. What about white quinoa? White quinoa is okay. You can eat white quinoa, okay. as long as a cup cooked. Okay. Right. And always mix your grain with vegetable because the fiber in vegetable slows down the breakdown of sugar. Your blood sugar will go up, but at slow rate, and will come down at a slow rate. So you're not looking an hour after dinner, you're opening all the cabinets in the <laughs> kitchen, refrigerator door, so you won't, that would not happen to you. And if you're diabetic, you should definitely have a bedtime snack. Not cookies, not pretzels, none of those things has to be pro whole grain crackers. Only few, like three or four or small crackers with maybe some hummus or a tablespoon of peanut butter protein. What's the cutoff time before you should be eating? Like if you go to bed, say, at 11 o'clock? 9 o'clock. That's it, okay. Drink two water. Hours, two hours before you should That's, yeah. especially if you have GERD. <laughs> or you don't want to end up with GERD. <laughs> About tofu. Tofu? Yes. Tofu is great protein. Soy bread. Uh, but if you don't have cancer in your family, why not? You know, you can have four ounces of tofu for lunch or dinner. An ounce has seven grams of protein. Isn't this just some study that there was something? There's some bad stuff about tofu. No, if not genetically modified. Oh. You want to have tofu that says it's not genetically modified and it's organic tofu. Oh. The way, you know, they grow it and pesticides. Uh, the various forms of uh, sugar, uh, I was living in Switzerland for a while and they maintained that uh, dextrose, <laughs> It's that your blood sugar has dropped it. It's okay to use dextrose because the body absorbs it differently than, than simple fruit, sugar. Than fruit juice, fresh fruit, right. those, all those others. Is that true or not? Well, I will tell you my age, but that's okay. When I went to school, the thing was that if you're blood diabetic, your blood sugar drop, you give immediately orange juice or whatever juice. Mm -hmm. Now it's changed because orange juice make your blood sugar go up quickly and you drop again. But the thing is now we say milk, which has lactose, is the same thing. It's right. not a simple sugar. So we use milk as when your blood sugar drops. And it shouldn't be skim milk. You see, fat slows down the breakdown of sugar. If you give skim milk, there's no fat in it. And a glass of milk, you go home, look at the back of the milk, has 12 grams of sugar or carbohydrate, yes. lactose. But if it has that 1% fat, that fat slows down the breakdown of sugar. So I tell my diabetics, maybe some of the physicians mm -hmm. don't like it, use 1% milk for, you know, to keep it on hand in your refrigerator if your blood sugar drops. So that's better than skim right. milk? Yes. yes. To raise your yes. blood sugar, you're talking. Right. If you have a situation right. where you need okay, to get right. your blood sugar up right. urgently, it. Right. it would probably be the right way to right. go. Right. Right. Thank you. What, mean, what does it mean when somebody tells you you are diabetic only spikes? Diabetic only spikes? Spikes. I go, I, I'm supposed to have diabetic. I take a pill. Okay. Mm -hmm. But I have nothing to measure in it. Absolutely nothing. And when I come to the doctor, she usually says, how's your sugar? And I said, I don't know. You didn't give me nothing to measure by. Well, she goes back to the computer, and then she says, well, you're all right. You only spike. What does that mean? She might be looking again at those, the fasting blood sugar, or she could be looking at the hemoglobin A1C. So you had blood work done? I had blood work yeah. done, and most of the time it doesn't show 
I would, I would just ask her to go over it with you because it has to show something when you're diabetic. She's looking at different factors, so uh -huh. she would probably be looking at your hemoglobin A1C, and again, if, it, if it's between 5.7 and 6.4, you don't necessarily have to test at home, but I would say that if you are taking medication uh -huh. for diabetes, you should be checking your blood sugars at home or at least have access to a home glucose monitoring because you can have dips and low blood sugar that can be even more detrimental and dangerous than high blood sugar. So you really should have some type of monitoring, not knowing your history, not knowing anything, just assuming right, on the basic right. guidelines. If you're taking blood sugar medications, anything that alters your blood sugar, you should have some type of monitoring device on hand to know how to monitor your blood sugar. So. Yeah, it sounds like you have an intermittent levels where sometimes it's normal and sometimes it's high. That's what they're trying uh, yeah, to do. Yeah, when I was in Florida, they took my, my you know, I drank that liquid. Okay. And they measured it in that case. Oh. It, it went up to 150, but then it went down to 100. And okay. he said to me, well, I really can consider you a diabetic, but I'm going to give you this medicine because if you don't take it, you've got a lot of blood sugar. It sounds like they did a glucose challenge test where they make you drink the blood sugar to see how your body uh -huh. will respond. It's what right. we call a glucose tolerance test. That's right. probably what they meant. But if you came down pretty quickly, that's a good sign. Right. But I think like, like Dr. Kim said, they're really, for the way for the doctor or us to get a better handle on it would be if you could check your blood sugars a couple times a day, then we can kind of chart the course of the blood sugars. And that will right. give us probably more information. Or most important is that hemoglobin A1C, and you're gonna be married to that number because that's the number that says the lower that goes, the better chance you have of having complications. We want that number low. And that's how we gauge our therapy. High A1Cs, if they're staying high for a long period of time, there's no question you're gonna be more prone to those complications we talked about. You know, the, the kidney, the eye, and so on. So that's really the number that's telling how well you're doing with diet, exercise, with or without medication. So, and, and I, I think probably every diabetic probably knows that number because that's something a doctor should be sharing, sharing with the patients on, on, their, on their quarterly visits. Well, then because they took that three month tapes and that that's turned it. out good. That turned out good. That turned out good. good. But then when every time I go there and she asked me and then she says, but your blood pressure is then, then I get kind of panicky. Oh, okay, <laughs> sure. But that's, I mean, that's really the key because that tells you how well it's controlled over a three month period. So that hemoglobin A1C is the key, not just a, a, a random sugar here or there. That is the number you want to keep low because I said that is absolutely correlates with less complications later down the, down the road, so. Oh, sure. Um, if you've lost a significant amount of weight, like 50 pounds within the last seven months and you didn't know you were diabetic, does that indicate you have, bi you have diabetes out of control? And you're now you're yeah, control? And you could probably help me with the answer to that. Well, some people who are obese actually don't have diabetes. There's no question it's a significant risk factor. So we kind of want to know where you started. If you had no blood sugar issues and your blood sugar was under control, so it's going to stay under control. However, if you clearly have an elevated blood sugar, weight loss is probably, I don't want to use a percentage, 90% of the time or even more, it's going to help your diabetes. Do you so. have unintended weight loss? No, I'm talking about my son. Uh -huh. he, he, he lost over 50 pounds. We didn't Great. know that he was diabetic. We just found out. Uh -huh. So what does that indicate? Well, it, sometimes it's a co concern with the absorption, you know, because if it's been elevated blood sugar, and Dr. Saber can concur, if you've had elevated blood sugars, the toxicity that occurs in the body, you're not absorbing things appropriately. But there's usually other signs like uh, urinary problems, like Dr. Saber had mentioned, thirst issues. But rap like weight loss like that means that the body's actually breaking itself down because it doesn't know what to do with the elevated blood sugars. In a general scenario, I can't speak for your son, but there would be other signs and symptoms, blood work that would indicate the abnormalities. So, uh, but Dr. Sabia is correct, weight loss would have reversed it, but I guess I'm not understanding you. The, if the weight loss was unintentional, then yes, unintentional. there's definitely concern for anybody that loses that weight under any circumstance in a short period of time. And then what we'll do as, as providers and physicians, you know, when we have unexplained weight loss, we, we poke around. Yeah, We're going to exactly. look, We're, you know, thyroid disease. 
you know, other things. You know, thyroid, can, disease. thyroid disease can cause elevated thyroid, just an example of what other things. And certainly we get nervous about other things that can cause weight loss. So, you know, every case is individualized, but um, usually weight loss, I mean, it really helps diabetes. So that's yeah. one thing we certainly would encourage. I lost a lot of weight okay. and I exercise now. Um, I had diabetes like 20 years. Should I still be testing? You I'm should get all medications. I don't so you were actually diagnosed as being a diabetic. I, 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 I think that's you, you. I think you still would require regular visits to your doctor. I, was on uh, I think absolutely you should require regular visits because you know even though your diabetes is but under I control. Need testing my right. sugar. Should I be doing that? Should well, that's up to be you and your doctor. I'm not okay. sure where you're at with your A1Cs and so on, but I, I think you know. Um, I think you clearly should be seeing a doctor regularly and have that discussion with your physician. It might not have to be um, visits uh, on a quarterly basis, but I, I think you know if you have diabetes, if at one point in time you absolutely should have regular visits and go from there. Do you need to be tested? I think that's the discussion between you. It sounds like less frequent testing would make sense. Dr. Kemp mentioned some stable diabetics may test twice a week. Yeah, absolutely. I think you, know? it's, you have so. to think of diabetes as a switch, as a right. light switch. You know, so you don't once you turn that light switch on. It's, it doesn't matter whether it's controlled or whether you have, there's a chance at all times that, that that even if you say you switch it back down to normal, you always have a propensity to switch it back on. So the fact that you've controlled it with diet and exercise, but the yearly blood test, as Dr. Savia mentioned, is the most important thing. If you start to see those numbers starting to creep above 100, where you go, you're starting to become insulin resistant again, then it's some, a conversation to have to perhaps check a hemoglobin A1C. You definitely want to do at least once a year blood test, if not more often. And remember, as a diabetic, again, the switch was turned on, you had an increased risk for coronary vascular disease, so you should have your cholesterol checked regularly as well. So those are the conversations. You don't Good. have to. That's you don't oh. have to. That's the whole thing with diabetes. You don't have to. Numbers that are acceptable for individuals who don't have diabetes are not acceptable for people with diabetes. Your LDL should be below 100, if not 70 and below for targets. Very so rigid criteria very though, rigid for criteria. diabetics with cholesterol. Yeah, a normal number so. for a diabetic is not going to be the same as a non-diabetic, so that's yeah. what we're, you know, and, there, and there, there's always a piece of genetics that's kind of yeah. mixed in with Absolutely. this, so you know, it's, I mean, it's so important to control your blood sugar, and I commend everybody for controlling the blood sugars and working hard to do that, and there's no questions, blood sugar control equates to better outcomes and less complications, but you still have that genetic basis in the background, which can cause problems with the heart and the eyes and Otherwise, the kidneys. Once you're a so. diabetic, you're always a diabetic. Yeah. Exactly. I think that's 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 the answer. That's a, that's exactly it. That's a good statement. But once again, by controlling your blood sugars and getting your yearly eye exams and seeing the podiatrist once a year, I mean these are all things that's going to keep you healthy and prevent less complications. So you know it's really um, it's really the program that gets you better. It's the diet, it's the exercise, and making sure that you see your doctor regularly, and certainly see those specialty doctors that can look at your feet to make sure you're not developing an infection, to look at your eyes, to pick up any changes in your blood vessels behind your eyes to see if there's a problem. And, and you know, if, you have some, if anybody has any mild to moderate heart disease, to see your cardiologist regularly. So it's like, it's pretty much a team effort to, to get better. Um, so if, there's, if there aren't any more questions, what I like to, I actually have asked two of my patients to join me this evening, two people I'm very, very proud of, and I don't want to put them on the spot, but I'll, I'll start with my good friend Barbara, who's really been a model patient, and I just thought I would tell a little story, and you can certainly fill in the blanks. This is, gal came to me, I've seen, kind of sees me on a regular basis, I think it was probably during our last physical, we picked up a little bit of elevation in her blood sugar, and kind of did a, we kind of poked around a little bit and did a little bit of deeper dive into that. And we find out she was a new onset diabetic, and her actual hemoglobin A1C was quite high. It was like 10 point 10.8. 10.8. And I, I think you felt pretty well, right? Yeah. I'm not sure if you had any symptoms of, you probably didn't have any symptoms of increased thirst, blurred vision. I mean, those symptoms, I, I think you had some subtle signs, but I, I don't had, mean. I, had, I started having some blurred vision, and my mother was a diabetic, and I thought I should know better, but I was kind of like denying. And then when I got the news that I am, I went back to the office and I was quite undone about it and I had said to one of my co-workers, this is like a death sentence, and she got annoyed at me and said, no, it's not. And I took a couple, I went and got a te you know, the kit to test and whatever, and I had said to Dr. Sadie, I'm not going to prick my finger. I type, I can't have sore fingers. He 
said to me, you won't have sore fingers. I said, you guarantee I'm not going to have sore fingers? Because if I have sore fingers, you know where I'm coming. Oh, she come right after me. <laughs> <laughs> so I went and I got my, uh, my meter and I pricked my finger eat before each meal. I thought when I first started, um, they just give you this little book. My, um, my uh, sh glucose level was still high. I thought, okay, we're going to take this under control. So I went and I got myself a composition book. I write down every day what my uh, glucose level is, what I eat, how I feel, and I keep tracked. And I took the bull by the horns and I've lost 60 pounds. My A1C is down to 5.6. Today. So, and uh, so I've just, I, and I, you know, I go out for dinner. Uh, it's a challenge. I don't do the bread. I don't do all of that stuff. I do eat some fruit. I'm very picky about my fruit. I have a Calorie King book that I go by as to how much carbs and whatever. Um, I eat um, yogurt, but I eat light and fit Dan and yogurt. It's 80 calories and it's only a half a carb serving. And I just keep track of that and I eat, drink tons of water. I will drink juices, but they have to be diet and I usually do part juice and I fill the rest with ice and water because I get tired of drinking plain water and I'm working on exercising. It's not my thing, but I've got a treadmill that I work for an attorney and he and his wife had gotten one of those elliptical uh, treadmills. And so he brought me his treadmill and I walk maybe half a mile, three quarters of a mile. If it's nice outside, I walk outside um, and I drink lots of water. I eat lots because I like vegetables. I eat lots of salad and my salads can have spinach, arugula, romaine, pumpkin seeds, sunflower seeds, um, the Delia onions, some great tomatoes um, I'll have into it, and I will use some, uh, sometimes I'll look for light dressings, and I found one dressing that I like to eat at night so it doesn't raise my level in the morning, and it's Walden Farms, and it's creamy bacon, and it has no carbs, no nothing into it, and it's 40 calories, and I like it. Is that okay with you? <laughs> <laughs> and, that's no, I mean, what, and that's what I've been doing. I've been just really, um, you know, I, I bake. I like to bake, and I still bake. I just don't necessarily eat it. And uh, if I want something, I had a craving for cookies, and I thought, I want cookies. So I had uh, pecan cookies, and I thought I have to... For me to enjoy this, I had my one cup of milk. I drink 2%. I will not do skim. I will not do 1%. <laughs> I do the 2%, and I saved up. You know, I kind of like Rob Peter to pay Paul. Had my four cookies, broke them up, ate them piece by piece. I'm happy. And that's what you have to do. Ice cream, yeah, I can sit down and, and eat a gallon of ice cream, but it's a scoop of ice cream, so I get a small bowl, and you chop it and make it look like you got lots, <laughs> you know. And, and you just you just do what you have to do. And I've just made up my mind that this is what I have to do. I my mother was a diabetic. She had cancer of the uterus. She ended up um, coming to the end of her life. One leg went. They were going to amputate the next. And I told my father I wasn't sending my mother in pieces. So I know and I've seen. So only I am going to feel better or not feel good. So that's my mission, to make me feel good. And as I tell, you know, as I told my employer, Dan, I said, I was a hot babe before, but wait until I lose the other 55 pounds. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm so. just, a, just a great swing, and I, don't, I deserve like this much credit because she, you know, Barb really just you know, took a hold of this and really um, owned it and um, just made a decision. And she's made some significant lifestyle changes and uh, just a real success stories. And I think with, we've only been at this since December, right? December. And that's wow. really just uh, that's very, very, very proud of her. Um, I asked another friend of mine, a patient who's been a good friend of mine, Mike, who's with us tonight, um, who's really been pretty much a picture of health over the last several years and has come in for yearly physicals and really has not. And then we just kind of noticed his blood sugar was high. And it was like, weird. why is she his be high? There's no history of diabetes in his family. He's pretty fit, he's you know, not heavy like me, um, 
And um, he, you know, and then all of a sudden we just realized, oh my gosh, I mean, his blood sugar was higher and higher. And then we did a hemoglobin A1C on Mike and it came up high. It was in the high eights, Mike, when we first started? 8.4. Yeah, 8.4. So, of course, us doctors, sometimes we say, wow, 8.4, what should I do to my friend Mike? Well, there's no question, diet and exercise. Maybe I should put him on some medication. I said, well, hold it a bit. Why start with medication? You know, he decided, uh, went to some of our di diabetic classes, let's do some diet and let's do some exercise. And absolutely, that was the way to go. And Mike, through diet and exercise and no medication, has uh, brought his blood sugar under wonderful control. And with some weight loss, what, what was the weight loss, Mike? I, I didn't hear you. Weight loss, and with some weight loss. What was your weight uh, loss? Well, it 15? went up, but it goes up and down. About 10 pounds, that's about all I lost. 10 or 15 uh, pounds. Yeah. Lots and lots of, lots and lots of exercise. And, um, you know, just, just eating, had him, we had him see our, our dietitian down there at, at, at our health center. And he, and he went to some diabetic classes. He's been testing regularly. And Mike is doing very, very well. So there's another um, success story that, you know, sometimes you can write the prescription, but you don't need to. You, you know, the diet and exercise really can do its job. So. Oh, it's the 108. Wow. wow. Awesome. So. So once again, a couple. Of, I'm sure there's lots of success stories in this room. But once again, what I, you know, if there's any other questions, please fire away. But I'd like to certainly thank you, folks, for um, for being here tonight and joining us. I hope this was worthwhile. I'd like to certainly thank our speakers and my two patients for joining us. And um, I'd like to thank the Panda folks. The Panda folks are have, have offered to tape this, and I guess we're gonna somehow will be either on YouTube or television, public TV. So the lecture will be will be um, televised and. Um, our good friend Fred Cardio, thank you for being here and, and filming this for us. And once again, I'd like to uh, thank you folks. I hope it was worthwhile. And uh, to come out on an evening like this, it says a lot. And uh, we thank you so much for being here. And um, good luck with your health. Stay healthy. Thank you.